Good evening. Welcome to our weekly wisdom Bible study in the book of James. And this is the second week we're coming from my office. And I just appreciate you tuning in to, to learn together from this, this wonderful book of God's practical wisdom that relates so much to the challenges we're facing right now as a church, as a nation, as individuals and families. Let's take a moment to pray as we open our study. Our God, we're so thankful. We're so thankful that, that you're here with us and that we can learn from your revealed words. And we, by the Holy Spirit, can now understand and apply those words so that we might believe and obey and live a life of, of real, of real joy and impact and effectiveness for your mission and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just mention to you that uh, our weekly wisdom Bible study will be captured on live stream. And now we're adding a YouTube uh, function as well. So if that's something that works better for you on your computer, uh, that might be something you, you look into. It'll be there on our website, like it always has been. And uh, you can click on either live stream or YouTube if that works better for you. But we're glad to, to come with you. Well, we're continuing our study. Last week I had some challenges. Um, with you, I was going through all the chapter two of James and I was really thinking through what it meant to work faith and works. Uh, this week we continue that study and I'm going to finish off chapter two and then dive into chapter three. And it, it goes in a certain sense in a different direction, but, but it's really living our faith out in the midst of challenge and change. You see, remember, if we just review for a moment, the book of James is written to those early Christians who are, in this case, mostly Jewish. The church is going to spread into the Gentile world. So the Jewish Christians are those who have that Old Testament background. They've grown up in faith communities. They're used to, they're used to hearing about the promises of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now they believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that he's their Lord and Savior. But they're beginning to understand that that, that can change the way they understand and live their lives. So in James 1, the writer James says that challenges can help us grow, especially when we seek the wisdom and the strength that God has. We don't blame God for the challenges that we face or the temptations because God's not the one who, who brings about temptation. We can instead endure through him and we can grow in our faith so that we put away what is evil. And then that faith takes a practical turn. We begin to care for those who are widows and orphans. And then within the church... In chapter 2, we see that we treat people with the royal law of love. Those who, are, those who are wealthy, those who are poor, we're one in Christ. And then it means that we live our faith out in a real concern and care for those who have special material needs as well as spiritual needs. And we show our faith in our works. So that's, that's one of the pieces we want to see and, and recognize. And now we're going to go here today, the end of chapter 2, couple important principles and then into chapter three where we'll talk about our tongue and we'll talk about wisdom, godly wisdom. Perhaps we'll get through the whole chapter today. We'll see. Verse 23 in chapter two says, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that Abraham reveals what the Bible has said from beginning to end, that our relationship with God is by his work not ours, but the work that he does for us and now in us leads to our good works. And so that becomes, and our good works are not the cause of our salvation, but they're the consequence of our salvation. We're, well, our, our relationship is not, the reason for a relationship is not good works, but good works are the result of that relationship. Okay. So those are some key principles and it continues. In verse 24, so you see that a person is justified by his works and not by faith alone. Well, what this is driving at is that, that we as followers of Christ show the justification here, I think, is, is going to be, as we read it in context, more of that horizontal. How do I show you? How do I show you that I'm a Christian? Well, God knows my heart. He knows that it's by faith alone. But others are going to see me and say, I think that guy's a Christian by the way he speaks, thinks, acts lives out his or her faith. So we're, we're really grateful. So that gives another example and it gets exciting here. Verse 24, 
You see the person is justified or shown to be a follower of God by works, not by faith alone. And then verse 25 says, In the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out in another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. The goal that James wants for us is a, a living faith, a faith that is vibrant, vital, that is connected to Christ, not only receiving the gifts of God, but trusting and relying upon the giver of those gifts, Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so one of the examples in the scripture was Abraham last week, who was so committed to God that he followed him to a land that he'd never seen. And then also to Abraham, who offered his son Isaac, and God miraculously saved his son. A picture not only of the death of Christ, Isaac, but the resurrection of Isaac slash the resurrection of Jesus. So we see the gospel portrayed there in the Old Testament. But now we come to this, this quick verse that says, in the same way, Rahab. Now, this is beautiful because we have this picture that's a little more obscure, a little lesser known. In the book of Joshua, Joshua came in to the promised land and they were going to take over the promised land. Now, when we know that story, we recognize that God has promised that land from Beersheba to Dan. These tw eventually, the 12 tribes will take over the great land of Israel. God has promised them that land as a place of inheritance, a place of rest, as a place of his presence and and their blessing, a land of milk and honey, it, it, it represents the new land to, to Israel is the new life that they have in God. And we see that recognized, by the way, if you want to do an interesting little Bible study, you can look at basically Hebrews chapter 4, where the new land that the people of God were moving into is a parallel to the new life that we enter. And so he, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 says that we who have believed have entered into that rest or that new land. Yeah, what a beautiful thing that is, that we now enter into a new relationship and a new, and a new reality, a new reality in Christ. And so we celebrate that and are grateful for that. But you see, Rahab was not someone who'd grown up in the faith. She was one of those inhabitants of the land. And so it's, she's one of the, in that sense, she lives amongst the enemies of God, but in a supernatural way, she began to identify that, that in a world of idolatry and immorality, she was a prostitute. She recognized the living God as the true and only God. And so she realigned her life. What an amazing story of God's care and love. He brings Rahab into a relationship with him. And so right away, we, we recognize that God, and think about this to the Jewish Christian, this is another opportunity for them to hear the message in the Old Testament that God loves the Jew and the Gentile. Loves the Jew and the Gentile. He loves the insider and the outsider. See, isn't that a, a challenge for us in the church? We, we love those who grew up in the church. God does. Loves those who grow up outside the church. He wants them to be brought into a relationship with him. Of course, Jesus tells us about that reality in the prodigal son. The one son who runs away into the far country and lives a life in a riotous way, it says, apart from God, God loves that prodigal son. The father in that story of the prodigal son, he runs to meet the prodigal, right? He cares and loves and embraces him. But the elder son, the one who stayed near, the one who was an insider, he needed the father as well. And many times the insider loses sight of his or her need for the gospel. Those who grew up in the church can forget the gospel. And one of the ways that we're refreshed in that gospel is by seeing those who are outside come in. Rahab is a perfect example of how miraculous and how supernatural salvation is. It's given to those just like us who don't deserve it. And so God calls a prostitute from the land of Jericho to be an ally, to become a friend of God. And so it is in Jesus' ministry that he often calls tax collectors and prostitutes. He calls outsiders. So that principle, I think, is being laid out here for those who are in this book of James. But the principle here is that Rahab showed her faith. And this is where it gets a little complicated for, it, for us. It says Rahab the prostitute was justified by works. Again, she showed her works, not to God, but to the rest of us and to history. When she received the messengers in the book of 
Joshua, these were called spies. They were spies sent into the land. How are we going to take over Jericho? What's going on in Jericho? Well, the spies were sent in the land. Well, there was the leak got out. There were leaks back in the ancient world as well. And so they, they found out and the, the captain and others came to Rahab and said, were there spies here? Were there messengers of this nation Israel that looks to be invading us? And she said, no, they went that way. She misled them. It says, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. In other words, this celebrates the alliance that Rahab had with God's people, that she stepped out of her own generation, out of her own culture, and became spiritually committed to the one true and living God. But there then leaves us a little bit of an ethical question. Is it okay to lie? So that's the, the main point of this passage. Let me reiterate it is, we are celebrating the fact that Rahab showed her alliance to God, her allegiance to God, by connecting herself to God and his people. And she sought to advance God's kingdom by protecting those spies. And she was willing to even see her own kingdom, her own culture crashed because that was God's purpose. Now that is a remarkable faith. Not unlike what we see in the book of Acts, when Peter in Acts 2 says to the people, he says, be saved from this perverse generation. In other words, those who were early church Christians had to step out, perhaps out of their Gentile culture, but for the Jews, step out of their culture that had rejected Jesus, right? And step into the church, which was outside what many thought was the true and living promise, but was the true and living promise of Jesus and his purpose. So Rahab then misleads the captain of the guard who comes to talk to her. What does that mean for us? Well, let's just pause for a moment and, and review this issue of lying. We know the scripture, well, the ninth commandment, the ninth commandment says very clearly that truthfulness do not bear false witness, that being honest all throughout the scripture, the book of Proverbs, in the New Testament, Jesus himself, truthful, honest, um, Telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is part of the Christian's life. We're to be honest. There are moments where we use discretion and we don't say everything in a situation, but we don't mislead people. We're not asked to do that. We're not called to do that. But I'm going to suggest that there is this one time, this exception here with Rahab and a couple of others in the Bible. I started thinking of two other situations, one in Exodus chapter 1. If you remember the story of the Exodus, Pharaoh welcomed the Jews, remembered in the time of Joseph. But as years went by, the people of God multiplied and Pharaoh became nervous about the population boom of the Jewish people. And so he went to the midwives, those, those delivery, the one who delivered babies and said, when, when a boy, when a, when a baby is born, when a baby boy especially is born to a, a Jewish woman, we want you to kill that baby. And there were these two midwives mentioned in Exodus 1 who felt, again, they did not listen to the evil that was being asked of them by their Pharaoh, by their leader. Instead, they aligned their hearts to God. And so it says in Exodus 1 that they, they basically let the children live. They protected the children, right? And allowed the Israelites to grow up and to prosper. They did what was right. But they also misled the Pharaoh when he said, what's going on? It seems like, the, and they said, well, the Hebrew women are so strong and vital. They have the children before we even get there. So we're not able to do everything. We're not able to accomplish the evil purpose that you have of killing the children. There's maybe one other situation in the New Testament, Old Testament. Abraham in Genesis 12 to 25 in his story, twice he's confronted with an evil king who looks at his wife, Sarah, and maybe looks with her with great desire, with great coveting, maybe to have a relationship with Sarah. And Abraham twice says, no, she's my sister. He doesn't tell the truth. Now, that situation is a little less clear because we don't know if it's just Abraham being weak and lying or if, again, this new principle that I'm going to suggest to you is true. So if we take the Rahab story and we take Exodus 1, the, the midwives lying, I think the principle is this, that we tell the truth, except in these extraordinary, and I'm going to underline the word 
extraordinary situations where evil is so incarnate in the authority that's standing above us that that evil entity has forfeited the right to truth. That that evil entity has forfeited the right to truth. And so the person in that situation is permitted and even encouraged to mislead the evil dictator in order to accomplish God's purpose. I can't think of that many times in my life where that's ever happened. I, in fact, I don't have any personal examples in my life. I could think of some hypotheticals where all of a sudden a man comes into my house, breaks into my house, and he has a gun to my head and he says, are your wife and children in the home? And they are. But I say to the, the person who has a gun to my head, no, there's nobody else here but me. And I, this evil perpetrator has forfeited the right to the truth. I'm operating out of God's greater glory and his purpose. I think the most practical historical example is, is not that distant. It's the story of the hiding place. It's the story of Anne Frank. It's there in World War II in the 1940s when the people of Europe are hiding Jewish people in their homes. They're, they're misleading their neighbors. They're misleading the authorities who have forfeited the right to know uh, that reality. And so in that sense, they're doing a godly misleading. Okay, extraordinary. Most of the time, again, this is not a, a, a pretext for us to mislead others at work or at church or in our neighborhoods or our families, our loved ones, but in extraordinary times. And so Rahab aligns herself with God and is righteous in sending them out. And so she shows a vital faith that can cut through so much fear and so much challenge in her life. So the story of chapter 2 is this, is that God's grace creates a faith that is living. Verse 24 says, we have a spirit that is alive in faith, and so it lives it out in good works. Well, we're going to continue that same theme into an, a particular application. And we're going to get into an area that is really, really challenging. And it, in chapter, verse, chapter 3, verse 1, it introduces us in an interesting way. It says this, that not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, this is talking about the spiritual gift of teaching. It's that verbal gift. It's that communicative gift. And the whole chapter is going to be talking about how we communicate with our tongue, how we convince people with the wisdom that God gives us. This chapter is about the output of God's grace that through faith we begin to live out the gospel in the way we speak, the way we live. And so verse 1 has a particular particular interest to us. It's that we should be careful that not many of us aspire to be teachers. Now, this is an interesting, challenging, humbling reality. What it's suggesting to us is that the role of teacher, the role of communicator is a, how can I say this? is a, in a significant role, and with great resource comes great responsibility. See, with great power, this is the old Spider-Man, right? With great power comes much great responsibility. When you're a teacher, when you're a parent, and you look at your children, you realize that you have such a power of influence. How you convey, what you convey to your children is immensely important. And so we need to be careful. This is talking, I think, mostly about the pastoral teaching role, that public teaching role. And again, in, in, in religious communities and in any community, whether it's the corporate world, but in the church, there's this desire. I'd like to be someone who teaches and stands in front of and helps other people this way. There's a certain, sometimes associated with that, a certain amount of notoriety, maybe some fame in that way. It's not true in our culture as much, but in the ancient days, those rabbis and leaders were were much esteemed. And so, if you think about it for a minute, there are many of us who would want to be in that position. Well, this passage says, let not many of you become teachers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. God is going to have a special, and this is sobering, those who stand in front of other people, those who sit and convey the scriptures, have a special responsibility to be truthful, not only in what they convey, but how they live. And that's why you see in the, in the Gospels, Jesus' strongest statements. If you want to read the hardest and the hottest rebukes of the of Gospels, 
you go to Matthew 23, and Jesus is scorching. He is scorching against those early, early Pharisees and Sadducees in the early church gospel moments. He is saying to them that they're teaching a false gospel. They're actually hurting people with the things that they're teaching. And Jesus is many times compassionate, sympathetic, kind, and easygoing with those who are outside. But those insiders who lift themselves up to say, I know what God thinks, and begin to teach, Jesus has a strict, strict, strong discipline and condemnation of them. He is very forceful. And so I think that's very important for us to see. And why is that? Because again, many are influenced. Many are affected by bad teaching. I am so grieved. I am so grieved in our world today. I, just think about this practically. If you turn on television, if you turn on the television, if you have a cable system, and you move through the religious broadcasting of what is on the TV, if you, if you are on that TV watching most of the things that is, are broadcasted and taught on television, Christian, Christian broadcasting are false teachings. Many of those teachers are doing and broadcasting what I would call a health and wealth or prosperity gospel. They're saying, if you support me, if you send money to my ministry, you'll have health, you'll have great wealth. They're equating gospel faithfulness with gospel prosperity materially. And that's such a false, but that is so common. And that kind of false teaching is so common, not only in America, but around the world. Well, this that kind of false gospel will be judged those who teach it but the other part is we know it so clearly those who are those who are teachers pastors and leaders how many have we seen who have fallen so their life doesn't line up with their their teaching and you see in the book of second peter chapter 2 chapter 3 the great condemnation that the peter has in second peter 2 especially on false teachers because they live a life of materialism and a life of sexual immorality. And of course, we've seen both those just again and again. Each decade that I've lived, I've seen pastors and leaders who sadly have stumbled. And so it's really important for us to be humble and to seek to seek a leadership position in any place in our life where we're communicating to others. Number one, to humble ourselves and wait for God to call us. Number two, to really pay close attention. What, what does the passage say? Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Is that 2 Timothy 4, chapter 12 and 13? Something like that. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching for you safeguard yourself and others. In other words, that, that paying close. So there's a, it's important for us to, to dig into God's word and know it clearly so we can communicate it, but then to also pay close attention to our own lives that we live it out faithfully. And that oftentimes and most often is going to take accountability it's going to take others in our life. We're going to have to live in community in order for that to happen. So first one begins with that challenge, but then it continues in a more practical way to all of us, in every one of us. And this becomes some of the hardest parts of the hardest parts um, in the New Testament. This talking about how to control our words. <laughs> so it says this, it says, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect person, able also to bridle his body. Notice verse 2 says something. There's a strong commitment in this passage, this whole book on faith leading to good works, putting away evil, right? But notice the realistic element here. We all, verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. There's always a recognition that God desires for us to be obedient, but we all fall short. And we fall short before we come to Christ, but even after we come to Christ, we all stumble in some ways. That's redemptive realism. We don't believe in perfectionism. The idea that once we trust in Christ, or even after a few years of following Christ, we move into a place where we don't sin anymore. In 1 John, it says, I write this so you may not sin, 1 John 2. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. See, it's a recognition, redemptive realism, the recognition that, that we're forgiven in our sins, we're free to grow in our faith, but we're still going to fall into those temptations, into those sins, into our failures. 
And the key is then to look back to God. But one of the areas that's most, most challenging, one of the areas that's really hard to look at and to face is this issue of words, our mouth, our speech. And it says, so it says in almost a form of hyperbole, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, that is our words, that person is a perfect person. In other words, if you have the kind of honesty and discretion and the kind of wisdom and edifying comments that build others up at all times, that, that is something that is so obvious and admirable. It's so hard. It's so hard to create. And it's so, so hard to maintain in the frustrations and the challenges of life. And so this chapter is going to challenge us to begin to think about deeply about what a challenge it is to live out of healthy and godly speech. And so it gets strong in its indictment and its challenge to us. And so it gives some images. It describes in verse 2 that he is able to bridle his whole body. So the idea is like a horse, the horse imagery, that this bridle, this little piece that goes in a horse's mouth, guides it. And so it is with our mouth. Now, of course, I want to pause here and say Jesus Jesus has told us that what comes out of our mouth really is what has come out of our heart. So as we're talking about our speech, it's really not just a matter of self-control in a verbal way. It's a matter of self-control and development in our heart and our attitudes and our affections and our contentment and our commitment to God. So it's a full orb commitment. So it's something to think about, but, but it expresses itself, shows itself right there in our speech. So verse 4 says, uh, look at verse 3, I'm sorry. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. Whatever the will of the pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So the point is we need to work at this issue of speech in our life. We can't just leave it a chance. Why? Because it's like a bit. It 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 puts us in situations, it takes us, it guides us in situations that are easy or hard, or like a rudder in a ship. It it turns a big ship either way. You, in your relationships with your wife, your husband, your friends, your roommates, the things you say can really make or break those relationships. You think about at work, the things you say can either cause you to be promoted or take away opportunities for greater responsibility and service. So this issue of verbal speaking, words and speech is a critical area. So we need to think about it. And so then it goes negative here in the next verse. So it is with the tongue, verse five, the tongue is a small member. It boasts of great things. How great a forest, verse five continues, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, set on, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on, by, on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. Well, this is a strong, strong word. It talks about our words being like fire. And our words being like poison. Think about both those realities. Fire. Just a little match. Just a little ember left in a forest fire. All of a sudden it burns the whole forest down. Think about the words that you've spoken to your children, to your spouse. Have they just been a little burn that has kind of seeped into their life? It's convicting. That is overwhelming to me to think of the things I've said. But in the church context... How great is the danger in a community that's supposed to be based on faith and love and trust and compassion and care. And when we begin to criticize, cut down or build, um, build a case against in a secret or in a larger group, those whispers that we think are small can set a fire. I've been a pastor now for many years and I'm just so thankful that one of the things that I've experienced in my first church and then here at uh, CPC is that in general, our church hasn't been set ablaze by the fire of gossip or criticism. We've been blessed. And that's something that God has done. 
It's certainly nothing that we can have done for ourselves or by ourselves. But I've been a part of many, many church commissions and committees in which I've watched churches come unglued. Pastors eventually chased out of their churches. Pastors chasing people out of their churches. Church families coming against each other. And I've seen those in case and case and case against where the littlest things that have begun to be said and whispered and spread have really burned the community deeply. Or the image here is poison. It's poison. And and again, I have experienced this as a pastor and as a person where things are said. And thankfully, in many situations, people have come to me and said, I've heard you said this about me, or I've heard you said this about me. And many times I'm like, I never had said that. What you heard was misunderstood or misspoken. And the reality is those kinds of poisons and fires are significant. And we need to really work at at not falling into those. It's a restless evil. There's something about our heart that's connected to our mouth that it's sort of fun. It's, It's sort of tasty, isn't it? To almost, the Proverbs calls it a morsel. It's like a morsel. It's a tasty thing to to criticize. And why is that? Again, criticism and gossip and slander are oftentimes, oftentimes done to elevate ourselves and diminish others. That's really most of the time what it's about. We're looking to elevate ourselves in our insight, in our position, and diminish others. They really aren't all that. And so that reality, so what we have to do to fight What we have to do to fight the kind of restless poison is once again, go back to the gospel, go back to the gospel and realize that our identity, our position in life, our future calling is really not dependent on others' approval, others' power over us. Our ultimate calling and success, our identity and our position in life comes from Christ, comes from God who who embraces us, that we have our self-esteem, not from being better than others but belonging to Christ. And then we begin to be able to bless God and bless others. That's how the passage continues. You notice that in verse 9, it goes on and says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. See, we're we're short-circuiting this circle of love. In other words, God has created us, and he's created us for community. And that community begins with us blessing God. And as we turn our hearts and bless God, we receive, we receive the blessings that allow us to do that. But then that overflows into the blessings that we give to others in word, in deed, in just the presence. Well, this passage is saying, if you short circuit that, we bless God, but the blessing doesn't then turn around and, and reach to others. We've really short circuited it the purpose for which God has made us. The love that God has for us should instill in us not only a love for God, but a love for our neighbor. And it's easy for us in one sense to say we love God, but the proof of that, this goes back to James 2, what's the proof that we love God? Is that we love our neighbor. What's the proof that we love our neighbor? It's how we think about them. But it's how we speak about them. It's how we live and act and serve them. So all those go together, and that, that's a challenge. So if you find yourself in a position where you are critical, often you're, you're filled with sort of poison and fire against others, I want to encourage you that you need to go look at where the source of that fire is. What's the hurt? What's the brokenness? I want to confess to you that I grew up in a family that was, was analytical, was was based cognitively. We were a cognitive, a high cognition, low emotion family. And so we were used to debating and discussing and analyzing. And what happens in analyzing cultures is they become criticizing cultures. Very easy. So we need to be careful that as we're a stronger analytical person, that we don't fall into the besetting sin, which is that critical side. And it's a confession. I fall into it all the time, especially when I'm feeling sense of inferiority, especially when I'm feeling a sense of inadequacy, especially when I'm feeling a sense of fatigue or a sense of feeling sorry for myself, then I begin to lash out and look for ways to cut others down or to criticize them, to bring them down to the place where I feel. That's the danger. And notice how verse 9 says, we bless our Lord and Father 
there's that circle idea again. The way we reestablish community, the way we reestablish the kind of vitality to our relationships and to our speech is to recognize that we belong. Our identity is part of one glorious, redemptive community. We're made in God's image. We're remade in the likeness of Christ through his life, death, and resurrection. And so now, so now we can bless and belong to him and to one another. Verse 10 goes on to, to show the incongruity, the, the not rightness of this. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. In other words, as God pours into our life, we should bless God and bless others. It goes together, faith and works. Blessing God and blessing others, they go together. It's this consistency, which, by the way, I want to pause here and say that's a theme of the book of James. If you want to really see one of the themes of the book of James, and it's going to appear later in our study, it's a reappearance of that phrase, two sold. Two sold. A divided heart. It's that we want to serve God, but we want to serve ourselves. We want to serve God, but we want to love the world. Do you see? There's always this two sided two-sided thing looks both ways the reality is we become anxious and angry analytical and critical people when you're constantly torn between two masters contentment is aligning ourselves with an allegiance to god and god alone it's what jesus is trying to say to us when he says in matthew 6 no one can serve two masters and so it says here from the same mouth come blessing and curse now, it shouldn't be that way. Verse 11, does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brother, produce olives and a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So once again, the challenge goes to the ultimate place. If you're spewing out poison, if you're spewing out fire, is that, is that revealing the fact that your heart really hasn't trusted, believed in the Lord? Oh, no, we're not saying that, that when you fall into the sin of gossip or slander, you're not a Christian. We're saying you're not living as a Christian should. And if that's the consistent and only response of your heart in relationships, competitive, critical, caustic, divisive, then you might want to ask the question, have I really processed, have I really received the grace of God that is to change my life? And so the rest of this chapter goes into a more positive mode um, in that sense, a more positive mode about the way we could live our life in relationship to the wisdom that God has and the way he wants us to live that out. I'm going to start in on this today and we'll come back to it a little bit next week as we move from chapter three to chapter four. But I'm just really touched by this, this reality. We have the opportunity. Well, does Ephesians say it this way? We have the opportunity to be able to to bless others. Words leave a mark. They leave a mark in our lives. I remember my dad had a phrase that he often used in my growing up, and he used it before our family all the time. And the phrase was this, never confuse effort with results. Now, there's a certain commitment to performance that I learned, and it was a healthy thing at one level. But on the other side, there was this overcommitment to performance that you tried your best, but if it didn't produce results, we didn't care. You just need to do it better next time. And it became this obsessive kind of approval seeking that was part of a lot of our family's structure. Those are words that came from my father. And I wonder in his life, what kind of things shaped that reality? Oh, I don't think he intended, intended to hurt us. But the reality is, I think he did form in us. Those words led to a kind of pathological sometimes commitment to performance at all costs. I think God wants us to, to be free from that, from that reality, free from that reality and uh, really have the opportunity. So how can we change that? Well, the verses 13 to 18 really become a beautiful passage for that. And I, I this is one of my favorite passages in the book of James and, and really for leadership and for life giving to others. This is beautiful. It says, who is wise and understanding among you? If you, if you translate this, who's the smart guy in this organization? Who's really the smartest person in your family? Who's the brightest person? I think if we would answer that, we would say, well, the one with the highest ACT or SAT score, the one who was the valedictorian, 
the one who <laughs> did best in school, the one who has the most degrees, the one who has the highest position in terms of responsibility and power in the company. Notice what this passage says. Who is the wise and understanding one among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. I can't help but think that this is actually a description of the life of Jesus, right? Jesus comes, the Lord of all, the only unique eternal Son of God, comes to earth. He takes on human flesh. And what it says here is that he lived his wisdom and his understanding among us by his good conduct. He showed us his works in the meekness, the gentleness, meekness, the power under control of wisdom. Of wisdom. In other words, wisdom is a way of life. Wisdom is a way of life. It's interesting. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord, that is reverence for God. The reverence we have for God is the beginning of wisdom. And so we begin to see that, that wisdom is a humility, right? It's a humility before God. Job, Job 28, 28 says that wisdom is shown in our obedience. Our understanding is shown in our obedience. So it's not only a deep character an attitudinal reality. It's an action. Wisdom is an actionable reality. It's an obedience. It's an expression. Relationally and productivity. Productively. Wow. Think about that for a minute. Real wisdom isn't just what we know. It's what we understand, how we relate, and how we produce what we do. Wow. So as a result, we move out of what we've oftentimes fallen into in the Western world is that wisdom is a cognition. It's just our brain power. And again, I don't want to diminish that. Brains are important, but it's not just our head. It's our hearts and our hands. It's all three of those realities. It's a full-orbed kind of wisdom. And of course, that's the kind of coach you want. That's the kind of mom and dad you want. That's the kind of brother and sister you want who's smart, yes but more importantly, full of good character, compassionate and productive and serving you and others around you. It's the kind of boss you want, the kind of person that you want anywhere in your, your life. That's why I think this is a great, almost a resume builder. If you want to build, build your resume, we do resume building in our culture through a review of the achievements of our life. But I think God wants to, along with that, add to a reflection on the character or the characteristics of our life, both in our attitudes and our hearts. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekdom of wisdom. But then it goes to show the contrast. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. <laughs> I'm always amazed how God's word pivots so quickly. The, the knife edge between good and bad, between right and wrong, isn't, it, it isn't a wide plateau. It's, it's just you slip off. And so if you're not showing true wisdom, boy, look at what you're, you're showing. It's a bitter jealousy. You're really bitter toward others' accomplishments, to their other others' existence. You resent others. You're in competitive competition, critical attitudes to everybody you meet. Uh, I can't help but think of this documentary we're all watching here about Michael Jordan. And there's so much that's admirable about Michael Jordan. I, I love basketball. I grew up in Chicago. Michael Jordan is just Fantastic. The greatest basketball player of all time. Just tremendous. I've enjoyed being able to watch it. But there's something about his character that while we admire his commitment and passion to excellence, there's something about his ruthless competition that leaves us a little uneasy. And I think there's good reason for it. I think there are ways that he treats his teammates as we watch this documentary that just leave us a little bit startled. It's stark in the way that it's so... It's beautiful in its commitment to excellence, but it's bad in the way that it diminishes and demeans other people. And there are just examples. We've seen it. And of course, it's something that in our families and in our church would be just devastating, devastating, selfish, bitter, 
jealousy and selfish ambition. Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. Now, one of the things we could pause and say, though, about Michael Jordan is that actually, while he wants to be the best, oftentimes his commitment to excellence is channeled. He wants the team to be his best. And that's that's where it gets difficult sometimes, isn't it? Where we as people want to do what is good, do what is right, do what is really excellent. And we want to bring others to that place. Well, let's look at this passage through those lens then. How do we find a way... How do we find a way to build others up, to bring about excellence in the church, in our work, in our family, but do it in such a way that we're not doing it from a bitter jealousy? Joseph's brothers back in Genesis, they were jealous of him. He had received that that coat of many colors. They were angry and bitter about that. The disciples, they began jealous with each other. In Matthew chapter 20, it's interesting that the disciples were wrestling. John's John and James' mother came and said, Jesus, do you think James and John could be at your right hand? There was a little bit of... Jesus had to stop that. He said, wait a minute, you guys aren't about bitter jealousy against each other and selfish ambition. It said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So this is what's going to happen in real wisdom. We're going to realize that our commitment to excellence has to start with God's story and his glory matter. Let me just put it the opposite way. God's glory and his story matter most and matter first. We are not the center of the story. So all of our wisdom has to operate out of what? The fear of the Lord, the reverence for God. If we're beginning to make decisions and beginning to live our life according to our own strength, our own selfish ambition, we're going to fail all the time in our family, in our work, in our church, in our life, in our community. We need to, as as people, start seeing this division on that. The wisdom that comes from above is going to be something that puts us... The way I like to describe it is this. I call it gospel grammar. It's kind of a silly but I think helpful way for us to describe it. Gospel grammar. Most of us, if we think of our life as a sentence, Hugh does this. Hugh... The problem is, when I make myself the subject of the sentence, this is the foundation of narcissism. Every sentence of my life is Hugh, Hugh, Hugh. The secret in trusting in Jesus is to move yourself from the subject of the sentence to the object and to place God in the subject. God in Christ calls Hugh. God in Christ commands Hugh. God in Christ encourages Hugh. In other words, we are made to be the object of God's affection, the object of his love and his leadership. The problem is we are forcing ourselves into the subject position and pushing God to the... It's me trying to earn God's favor. Hugh's trying to earn God's favor. Hugh's trying to avoid God's leadership. See, when I'm the subject, I'm in trouble. God needs to be the subject of your sentence. And then you and I need to place ourselves as an object of his powerful work. And the next piece is to recognize that God, the verb in your sentence, is an active, loving reality. You see, most of us believe that God exists, and we're over here, and we're not connected. Gospel grammar is that we put God in the subject. We put ourselves in the object. And then we recognize, right? That God is active, living, powerful, in loving, leading, guiding, preserving, challenging us. He's moving into our life. And then you begin to have a living faith that is reflected here in a powerful, personal, practical wisdom. Now, we're going to come back to this next week where we see some of the negatives, but some of the positives. But I want to, I want to continue on with this beautiful passage about wisdom. And then we'll continue on in chapter 4 and talk about worldliness. And I hope, I hope you're beginning to see these themes coming together. That reality is, in the life of the church, we struggle so much in our relationship issues. So often we, we emphasize the IQ issues. I know this, I know that. But it's not just IQ, it's EQ. That is, those emotional, those relational, those character issues that lead eventually to, well, I'm going to call it CQ the ability to move into the culture of this world. 
the cultural quotient, that we're able to care and love and minister in a changing and challenging world. That's the kind of follower of Christ that we need to be. So I want you to think about gospel grammar. I want you to think a little bit about that wisdom is more than IQ. And then revisit the fact that our speech is a part of that whole reality that God is transforming. And I hope this Bible study today has been helpful for you in this way as God leads us. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you again for this passage, for the way that you're guiding us. And we just ask that as we come back to it next week, that you guide us again. And I pray that we could put into practice this week healthy, edifying speech and that we would really look to be able to do that for your glory and for the good of others and that we would begin to discern what good and effective wisdom is as we move toward next week in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I miss being with all of you. Love coming every week through this and I hope this was an effective way to communicate to you today God's truth in practice. Take care. Bless you.